Hey Queens, welcome back to Gears and Queers. I'm Chris and um, Jake lost a bet, so he is temporarily a smallish dog. Today, we're here because uh, a bunch of you guys have been DMing us asking like car advice, you know, what to look for, what to avoid, things like that. We're gonna start like uh, answering some of those questions and things like this. Today's subject is gonna be the CB7 generation Honda Accord, the fourth generation produced from model years 1990 to 1993. And of course I have one. She is known as Honda Babe. I love her very much. She is what I refer to as the Asian Volvo 240. Very reliable and incredibly satisfying to own, but um, nobody's perfect. We're just gonna go over a couple of things to look for if you guys are looking to get into one of these. Hopefully it'll make you more aware and uh, more learned. But let's get into it. So honestly, I think uh, the first thing to look out with on these cars and really any Honda of this generation and even some of the years later is rust. Um, this is definitely a non-starter for me. Um, you know, we do live in the South, so really cars don't rust here anyway, but you know, we're talking about potentially 30 year old cars here. So some of them may have lived their lives in the North, other places where, you know, they salt the roads and this could be an issue. Fortunately, my car was in Atlanta its entire life really, except for like a year in Seattle when it was new. So mine does not have any of the typical rust but one thing that i feel like is the most obvious is the rear fender wells are going to start bubbling first all that road salt just gets kicked up enough and something about the design of that like lip on the fender means that's where it's going to get it first and if it starts really coming through in that spot then you definitely know you have rust in other places and really it can just eat the whole car at that point so be on the lookout for rust we don't like her. Number two is the rear window regulators. Not unique to this car, but definitely something that it uh, experiences often as a failure of the little plastic gear that is one of the guides on the cable driven system. One of the most uh, early failure modes of this is you'll realize that the rear window will get all the way to the top, except for like the last quarter of an inch. It won't close entirely. Basically, it's, it's binding at that point and the writing is on the wall. Window regulator and motor come together. You can get a new one for like $45. I had the misfortune of replacing two, both of them. So when I bought my car, I was thinking, oh, maybe the window is just like whatever hasn't been rolled up all the way. I didn't notice it. And then uh, come to find out it was broken. So window regulators. Number three is going to be brakes. And I know it's like, you know, any, any used car you buy, you really want to look at the brakes. Something unique about the CB7 that will make a simple brake job go from simple to maddening is the design of the front brakes, specifically the captive rotors. On normal cars, they have a rotor overhub design. So that means you do not have to remove anything really other than the caliper um, to get the rotor off. Very simple. This is how my infinity is. Brake jobs are a breeze. But somebody at Honda thought that a hub over rotor design would be more beneficial, something satanic. I don't know, <laughs> really just don't know. That's how the CB7 is. So to replace the front rotors, you actually have to like undo the entire steering knuckle, separate it from the axle, and then remove the hub and rotor as a unit from that. And a lot of times, especially on those rusty cars, they are seized to the knuckle, and then you can separate the hub from the rotor replace the rotor and reassemble it. Basically, you're taking apart half of the front suspension just to replace your rotors. It is maddening. While not necessarily a non-starter, I think that that would really just be something that you could negotiate. If the car needs front rotors, realize that that's gonna be a very expensive thing to do at a shop or it's gonna take a lot of your time to do. So peep those front rotors. Number four, the distributor. You know, I was kind of hesitant to include this one on the list, but it is such a complex for this time period piece of engineering. Basically all of the ignition system sensors are located within it. And some of them are actually non-replaceable. You have to replace the entire distributor at once. That, you know, while really kind of an impressive, cool thing, this little packaged unit can make serviceability a little bit of a pain. For my car specifically, the top dead center sensor occasionally does not send a signal. It's very infrequent, but it'll cause like a long crank and a check engine light, which goes away after the next start. But it's really kind of annoying. And I think that I might've been able to notice that before I bought the car, if I had been able to pull the pending codes from the computer, which it's OBD1, it's not OBD2, so it's not that simple. But 
Uh, maybe in another video, I'll show you guys how you can actually get the car to blink the codes by jumping a wire in the kick panel at the passenger side. But also, on the 1990 only, there is a little window on the ECU and the floorboard that will blink the codes at you. So be on the lookout for that. Number five, we all knew she was coming. The timing belt. These engines are interference, so this is not a topic you should take lightly. The unfortunate thing about the CB7 and the F22 engine, which they all have, is that you have to remove the valve cover first in order to see the timing belt. Um, there is a little like a timing cover, but it is actually like underneath a lip of the valve cover. To even inspect it, the valve cover has to come off. Then you can like peek in or remove that timing cover as well and kind of like see the condition of the belt. I'm kind of dumb, so I bought my car assuming that the timing belt had been done because of a uh, <laughs> guarantee on the behalf of the previous owner. I did a valve cover gasket and the tube seals uh, very shortly after buying the car to inspect the belt, and it looks like it's brand new. So you really dodged a bullet there, but that's not a practice I recommend uh, keeping. If you do want to inspect the timing belt and there's not a receipt of when it was last done, that's what you're going to have to do to get under it. And I know that that might end up being a point of contention with some sellers. And it's really kind of an unfortunate circumstance when other cars just allow you to take it off and inspect the cover without taking anything else off. So it is what it is. That being said, y'all, I am constantly in awe of how satisfying a 30 year old Honda Accord is to drive and to own. The reputation these cars have is deserved. Like it is incredible how well these things stay on the road. Like I see them all the time and a lot of them are in much worse cosmetic shape than mine and mine's not perfect. You see way more of these things than you see like the contemporary Ford Taurus or like anything from GM. Speaks a lot to the longevity of the design of the engineering. What a fantastic car but also the fact that people are willing to keep them on the road because of what they are. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you actually like got something out of this video. And if you want us to do more, you know, we have a small fleet of rapidly aging vehicles uh, to choose from. Please make sure to like, share, and subscribe, and um, we'll love you forever for it. So, bye-bye.